Well, hi everyone. Are you guys, are you, Brian, Jennifer, are you guys ready to? Yeah, ready? Let's, let's roll. Okay. Hello everyone. This is Larry Michael, your love shepherd. And I am like beyond, beyond, beyond excited for this call tonight. It's like, um, well, I, I will just tell you more and more. Th these have become two of my favorite people and we don't even know each other very long, but you know how sometimes you just kind of go, oh yeah. So this is one of those, oh yeah. And there's lots of good reasons behind it of which you're going to get a chance to experience. So let me tell you who we're talking with. We're talking to Brian Franklin and his lovely lady, Jennifer Russell. And by the way, that would be his, her lovely man, Brian Franklin. Together, Jennifer and Brian have led 20 years of impactful transformational programs and events designed to liberate people from self-imposing limiting beliefs and unlock their evolutionary potential. So if you didn't know you had evolutionary potential, you do. You're going to find out why and get a chance to embrace it tonight. They incorporate the best of neuro-linguistic programming, the human potential movement, family systems, attachment theory, collaborative systems, neuroscience, spiritual practices, tribal circling technologies, and sacred theater. Go figure. That's like, this is so exciting. They're the co-founders of Evolving Love, where they facil ah, come on, Tom. They facilitate a series of retreats, workshops, and courses designed to rewrite your relational DNA so that you can embody your ideal love story. Who wants that? See, this is where you should all be going, yay, yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those videos aren't on. I'm just imagining you're doing this. Okay. They work with singles and couples to develop extraordinary relationships that point the way to significant personal evolution and the skills to develop a higher relational quotient, RQ, which is a very, very special conversation. I don't know that we'll get to it tonight, but it's important. They stand for relationships that have a both and rather than an either or relationship to freedom and devotion and realize the true potential that healing the divide between the masculine and the feminine has on creating a healed, healthy, and whole culture. They have developed powerful models that can help build the three pillars of great relationships, all of which we'll probably be talking a little bit about tonight. They sound awesome, right? It's so, Oh, thank you for having, what a beautiful way to introduce us. We're so excited. Everything you said is mutual, Larry. We feel so the same about you. <laughs> so let me tell you all why tonight, why now, why the urgency? So, you know, I've been working with singles and couples for decades and I love the work. And I'm also constantly wanting to grow and learn from other experts and not just experts. I learn a ton from my, from my clients as well. So a couple of weeks ago, I was at this private event and Jennifer and Brian were there and they, it was the first time that I got a chance to really sit in the audience and listen to them and, and participate. And so I've known a lot about their work for some time, I have a lot of respect for it and, and a lot of curiosity for it, but I hadn't experienced the two of them together. And one, the way they communicated and the way they interacted with each other instantly, just like, ah, oh, I want more of this. And then in the midst of this, they actually brought up a distinction that for me was pivotal. So you know, for years, you've probably heard people talking about there's him, there's her, there's you, there's me, and then there's our relationship, there's the we, and I'm one of those people that are really, I'm big, You, if you've read my work, you know I'm big about how important it is to have that we in the relationship there, and they took it to another level that is so pivotal and so foundational that I don't think any relationship truly survives without it. And that is why I said, we need to talk. We need to talk and not just talk the two of the three of us. We need to share this with everybody, anybody that's in a relationship, anybody that's been in a relationship and is not right now. This is an opportunity to discover what's one of the most important ingredients that exist. 
And this is just one small piece of what they do, but we're going to talk about it tonight and other things and share as much with you as we can. And you'll have a chance to ask questions. And truly, we'd love you to turn on your video so we can see you. Don't be shy. We know how beautiful you all are. And we just welcome you in. And Brian, Jennifer, thank you. Thank you guys for how you've shown up in the world, for what you do, and for so quickly making this possible, because this is kick-ass cool. It really is. That's a technical Absolute pleasure. It's our absolute pleasure. I mean, this is some of the most juicy conversations we want to be in, and that we get to do this with everyone on this line, and with you, who we also admire. Like... I, I think uh, there are conversations we've already had that I've often wished people could voyeur, like, oh, oh, people would get a lot out of that. Let's share it. Let's have them interact with us about that. So I'm excited for tonight. I think we're in for a really fun ride. So glad you all are showing up here. And uh, uh, thank you for having us, Larry. You're very welcome. So I have a couple questions to kind of get started. So, you know, this bio of yours is immense. It's awesome. And... <laughs> How the hell did you get to this place? <laughs> so I know that you each individually have your your expertise, your acumen, and and it goes beyond just I can't say it goes beyond relationships because everything's relationships. Exactly on the romance element of the world and into bigger things. And I would love it if if kind of individually you could speak a little bit about how you got here. Sure. And then I want to know how you two got here, like how that happened. And I think that's really, um, people will really be interested to know this. I know I was. Uh -huh, great. Like the origin story, right? How did we get to where we are now? Yeah. You want to start my love? Yeah. So um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go second. I mean, I've, I've been a student of transformation and leadership, you know, basically since since the day I became an adult, you can argue whether that was a few days ago or when I was 19 or 16, but um, whenever that was, ever since, ever since then, I've been uh, I've been really focused on what is it that allows us to change into becoming the people we'd rather be. What is it that um, takes something that's difficult and out of reach and makes it easy and within reach? And what are you know what what is that? I've been. Uh, so I've been an executive coach for 21 years and, um, and therefore I thought I was pretty awesome at relationships. And, um, when I was, uh, engaging in the divorce of my first marriage, I had to realize I had to come to terms with the fact that I was not awesome at marriage and, and that I was missing some really, really important vital things maybe the most vital things. And that all the conclusions that I had made about what makes love work and relationships work and families work for me were suspect. I didn't, I knew some of them were right and some of them were wrong and they didn't know which was which. Hmm. And I was in that complete beginner's mind of, I need to, I need to learn from scratch here. And in that space, I met Jennifer hmm. and she was that was then and is now the most inspiring person I've ever met. And I fell madly in love and, and we decided to, to make it up from scratch together, like to just follow where, where, what are the impulses of our hearts? What do we want? What are our desires? What, where do we want safety? Where do we want adventure? What, what is it that we're seeking in our dynamic? And then how can we craft that? Um, and I could say more, but I can give you a chance. Yeah. Well, I, just to add on to that, it's like taking off of automatic the way we were relating and like brick by brick with just being really deliberate. Like how do we build an evolutionary relationship when each of us had so much background in transformational work? So um, I, my origin story, I, I just a little bit about it. Um, I had the, the blessing of having two of the most polarizingly opposite parents that you could imagine. I, my father was the like quintessential masculine uh, force. He was six foot four, 280 pounds, a Vietnam veteran pilot, um, intense, shrewd, intellectual, um, strong, 
you know, bravado, aggressive. He had all of those qualities. My mother on the other side was uh, quintessentially feminine. She was soft and sensual and spiritual and creative. And she wasn't in, involved in the rat race and just wanted to make art and beauty. And in trying to figure out as a young girl, how do I become the kind of person that can get love from these two very opposite parents who ultimately divorced in a, in a, in a cataclysm because they couldn't find each other. I, in that way that we are when we grow up is we become this perplexity of, of, of evolution where you try to grow yourself into the woman that can actually gain love from both parents. And in doing that, um, I realized that I could integrate and heal that divide. It became a mission for me. I felt the divide between the masculine and feminine that was at the heart of war on our planet, really, literally, um, and wanted to stand in the midst of that and be the bridge and be both a force of nature, a manifester. I you know, started many, many companies. We've probably started 12 companies together. Some people say I get more done by accident than people do on purpose. Like I, I have my father to, to thank. Thank you, father. I am strong. I am powerful. I am a force, right? And I am unapologetically feminine and sensual and connected and empathic. And so what I felt was possible in a way that so many of us marginalize was actually noticing that if we don't marginalize these two polar opposites, we could actually become the integration of two things, pop out of where they're paradoxical and at war and realize a life where you actually have both and, like he said in the bio, not either or. And I don't wanna be one or the other. I wanna be all the way masculine and all the way feminine so that in a moment's notice, I can bring both or either when that's what's not needed. So I was on that journey of really wanting to heal that divide. Did that take you some practice? <laughs> oh, I went through all of the things that so many, I think, on this call would relate to. Like, I did all the things where I marginalized my feminine and became over-masculine. I, I then kind of let go of the masculine and kind of collapsed into my feminine. And all of the things that you might imagine in not actually embracing the actual gifts of both and the shadows of both. And um, so, yeah, I would say, and, and learning from parents that couldn't even get along. I got to, you know, grow up in a, in a really difficult household. Um, and so I got to see what a dysfunctional love looked like, but not a functional one, right? So uh, you have me very curious. Um, yeah. Actually, I'm thinking about you, Brian. And, mm -hmm. you know, you guys know me, I, it, from my genetic energetic works, enroller women are very masculine. And, and I have been in enroller women relationships for like three decades. Right? <laughs> No, so I've I've had the opportunity to have my legs removed and have them to grow back. <laughs> um, and so I'm curious, Brian, as you, as Jennifer was going through this, and I don't know how much of this was happening while you guys were in relationship, and how much of it happened before you met. But um, a lot of both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Yeah. I, I experience you as being a very masculine entity. So I haven't. I don't know you well enough yet to see the feminine side. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. I, I've been working on that. So that's, a, that's good news, Larry. I'm, I'm stoked. Well, I, uh, <laughs> that's like music to his ears. Cause he, yeah. <laughs> I'm, curious, though. I'm, I'm curious to, to know how your experience of, of Jennifer's growth actually impacted your own growth and your own relationship to the masculine and feminine. I mean, immeasurably is the, is the answer, but the, we um, we connected. Part part of how we fell in let fell in love is we we connected on a shared love of range, a shared love mm -hmm. of uh, extremes of um, you know not um, not left or right, but how far of both can we have? Not up or down, but how far of both? Not soft or hard, but how can we be the softest and the hardest? And so. And in, in that kind of um, wanting to have, wanting to feel the extremities of what could be experienced, 
and field goal, entire range with everything in between. Uh, you know, that's how we found, I, we found love. And I said to Jennifer, you know, she said it early on, Hey, you know, I know it's a kind of a touchy subject. We are talking about actually the divorce. And she said, I don't want to cross any of your boundaries. I said, obliterate my boundaries. My boundaries contain me, you know, like I, I want, you know, I don't want Let's everyone expand the container. <laughs> I don't want everyone to cross my boundaries, but you, that's just, there are none. Let's just, let's just see how far it can go. And so we, we really started to um, uh, value fluidity between things more than one thing or the other. So um, I love a mask, you know, I love Jennifer's masculinity. I think it's really sexy. I love her femininity. I think it's really sexy. And it's never a problem for us or for me uh, because she's really fluid. If she's in a really masculine moment and then she's called to be feminine, it have, you know, she's feminine in the next, it can change in the middle of a sentence. So it's not, I never concerned about how one way or the other way anything is because what we've co-developed is a value of um, flexibility, of fluidity, of being wherever we need to be for what's called for in the moment. Yeah. And, and that is a, it's been a journey of kind of letting go of a role or identity or an idea and really paying attention to what's real and what's happening and what's present right now. And that's really rich. What, what you just said is super important. Like, I mean, almost want you to like to repeat it again and again, which is the, you know, the normative, what you're doing is not the normative for sure. Right. Yes. And the common is to hold on to this concept of the masculine and the feminine or male is and the female is. And, you know, when you hold on to those so tightly, there's no way you guys could do what you're talking about. That fluidity, I don't think is possible. Um, well, it's hyper divisive and, and we live in a pretty hyper divisive culture and we can see the fruits of what that creates, Wh whether it's in your relationship or with your colleagues or with people on the left and the right or the rich or the poor or the black and the blue. You know, this is this is a recipe for a lot of toxic cycles and petty fights. Right. If we do this. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, you're going to say something. I've completely lost my train. Oh, so oh. go ahead, Larry. Go ahead. <laughs> I think he was going to say something. I, I could talk about the, even just this piece for a while. So you, you take us where you want to take us. Yeah, there's, there's more. So my belief is that for people to hear your experience and how you transition, yeah. holding on to, you know, holding on tightly to, I must be this, this masculine, or I must be this feminine and, um, or, I don't want to be feminine. I want to be masculine or I don't want to be the hard ass guy. I want to show my femininity, but I'm not supposed to, or no one lets me. Or when I do, I get called under the carpet. Like I did something wrong. Uh, you know, you clearly made that transition, which I think all of us need to make. How did you do it? Mm -hmm. Come on, give well, us I, I mean, for me, I, you know, when I observe, I don't think there's anything toxic about masculinity, for example. I think that toxic masculinity is, is masculinity when femininity is what's called for. And toxic femininity is femininity when masculinity is what's called for. So I just, I just ask myself, do I, would I rather be a thing like masculine or a label, strong, or would I rather develop my ability to know what's needed? And it seemed cooler to me to, to be better at knowing what's needed. And so I started paying more and more attention to that. And you know who has more access to, to your blind spots about what's needed than any other person? Your partner. Is your partner. Yeah. All these, you know, every time we have a different idea about how to, what to say, what to do, whether we X, Y, or Z, how to handle a particular situation, a friend to us, come, a friend comes to us in distress and we have different impulses about help or don't help or how all of that is information about what's needed that I, I wasn't aware of and then you know that I get to learn through, through Jennifer. Was it scary? I mean for sure anytime you're have a thing anytime you have an identity that you think you are and you're losing it it can that can feel uh, fearful just mm -hmm. like before you jump feels afraid but as soon as you do it's super fun. Yeah. I want to, can I add a little piece? Because you asked a question and I, I want to, I, I think I want to double underline because you said, how, how did you do this? Because 
if it's not the kind of the the norm, let's say some of us do, some of us don't. What what led you led you to do it, and how did you do it? And I There's probably a why in there too, and and a why, yes. So uh, we have, you know, we ha- we have these ten distinctions, these ten breakthroughs that 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 are like common ordinary views that people have that we've been swimming in. And we've been unwittingly fed this in our culture in every movie and the hero's journey and <laughs> everywhere we look. And one, one of these uh, ones is really at the core for me of, of the how, which is we often, <laughs> we often have sort of a fixed sense of identity and um, a fairly flexible sense of commitment. And, and here's why I say that, it's because if if any of you have been in, you know, serial relationships, one after another after another, then you know that you're operating from this paradigm, which makes sense at the time, because it's like, OK, I'm going to be with this person until and unless it's not good for me and not good for me can mean all the way from it's toxic and you really do need to exit. And it really isn't good for you all the way to, oh, I'm hitting your own. You're, I'm hitting my own blind spot. There, it's painful that I'm having to see it, and I'd rather not look. Right, so so we we have flexibility around our commitment. We leave when it gets tough, and we leave when we don't like what we see. We leave when we think our partner isn't who 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 we want them to be, and uh, and we tend to be a little more ossified, a little more rigid about our identity. Um, and you know, because we build a whole temple around it, it's like we've built our whole lives around being the person that we are and having the ego identity that people see us as, and we, we are have preciousness around that. So that fixed identity and a flexible commitment is the common ordinary view that makes a lot of sense. It's very reasonable. Well, the how, what, how we did, what we did is we really literally reversed it. So instead, what if we decided together to have a fixed commitment, unassailable, foundational, solid commitment was fixed, but our identity was what we held as flexible. Because you need one point of stability to create safety and growth and locomotion. And you need one point that is is got, got motion so that you don't stay stagnant and then you have that thing that happens in relationships where you butt heads and you go apart or it fizzles and it drains. So you need the stability, instability, stability, instability to even literally walk. So how we did it was that we decided very early in our relationship that we were going to make our commitment to one another, the stable datum. We were going to be all the way solid. We weren't going to use leaving each other to solve our problems. And interestingly enough, I freaked out when we did that and went into a like two months depression of holy, what could I just do? I signed up to be with a guy. What if he's awful to me? I can't get out of it. Like, why did I do this? This is awful. This is terrible. This is scary. So I went through all of that, doing, doing the thing we're telling all of you to do. But what I found was what unlocked for me was the longevity that I never had. I had 16 relationships before Brian, one to the other. And so when I did this, what happened was all of the patterns that had me feel unsafe, like started to relax. And that level of safety, love, safety, and belonging that was so assured unwound a lot of those anxious patterns and those aggressive and avoidant patterns and those codependent patterns. And so that stability allowed me us to do what we do, allowed us to be like, okay, well, let's be a little flexible with who we are with each other. So that's, that's a piece of the how, right? Is, is that you, you, you reverse what you think, uh, uh, you reverse the common knowledge and put your identity as flexible and your commitment as stable. Would you say there are um, a couple underlying like core beliefs that had to shift? Mm. You to stay with that? Mm-hmm. All scary thing to do. Right? Yeah. All yeah. the ones that start with I am. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's um you know that is uh, was very simple for you to say, but that's huge what you just said. Yes, it's a profound thing. It's even if it's in its simplicity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
I am just like, I want to like, you know, take a break and just think about that, but we don't have time to take those kind of breaks. So I hope well, people- every, every time I would think I am blank, what I would later learn is that that was a protection against intimacy. Mm. And that if I was willing to be wrong about that, then I could have more Jennifer. I could have more love. I could have more uh, selfness. I could have more uh, beauty. Wow. Uh, Were there times where you thought, uh, am I crazy for doing this? Like Jennifer did? Were you... (laughs) time when she was going through this I don't know I mean there there were moments I thought for sure I like for sure I'm going to lose like if I say this thing Jennifer's going to leave me like if I really am myself all the way if I reveal this thing I'm going to be alone if um if I give up on being this person then I won't be able to be in the world in any meaningful way um but um well you know we have another so Jennifer mentioned that there's these 10 ways of going from an ordinary relationship to a truly extraordinary one. Um, and I would highlight another one actually around fear. You mentioned fear a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And an ordinary relationship, when you discover your partner has a fear, in, in an ordinary relationship, you try to protect them against that fear. Your partner says, I'm afraid of bi- bridges. You say, great, we're not going to go over any bridges. They say, I'm afraid of broom closets. You go, great, we're removing all the broom closets from the room. (laughs) Or I'm afraid of this type of interaction. Or I'm jealous because I'm afraid you're going to leave me. And you just try and insulate more and more each other from fear. Well, or even coddle. Like, oh, oh, honey, oh, gosh, let let me take care of you in that fear. Like, like it's really natural. I mean, instinctual almost. And in an extraordinary relationship, um, uh, we help our partners face fears. So it's like, oh, you're afraid of bridges? Look, I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to be right beside you. We're going to go on this bridge. I know it's going to be scary and I know that you're going to freak out, but I promise you it's okay. Um, I'm not afraid of bridges. So you're going to leave, you know, in the relationship, you're going to, you're going to make determining whether the bridge is safe up to me. And I got you. Let's do it. And then, and so Jennifer held my hand and I faced my fears And then, as you know, every time you really face a fear, it disintegrates. And so you just get stronger and stronger. And then I held Jennifer's hand and she faced her fears. And we just kept doing that for each other. So that, I mean, that's a beautiful Mm -hmm. support. What happens if you both have the same fears? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Do you want want me to to take this one? Yeah, well, um, you know, we'll often say that you're, your relationship, you know, your partner is someone that can help you see your blind spots, right? Um, You know, because we reserve both the best of us and the worst of us. Our partners get to see a real front row seat to the best and the worst. You at your most magnificence, like they get to see you in that and that you at your worst, the way you wouldn't treat anyone, (laughs) they see that. So they have a really good window into your blind spots, but the relationship itself can often have a blind spot, like where you're in the fear and you're both like, how do we pull ourselves out of this? I can't help you. You can't help me. And what we often will say is that um, uh, a community of conscious couples that you surround yourself in um, is a great way to have a community that can see the relationships blind spots. So it's, it's, it's one, it's good to have your partner to help you with that, but it's good to be surrounded by people whose relationships you admire and um, that that can can take a look and reflect to you and mirror to you. And I know like you, you, you and I both or all three of us love community building and building whole places where so so people can come together and do some of that mirroring. Yeah, that's why in our work we all we always include um, couples going through the process together. And like so, love pods, we call it. Yeah. Jennifer can see my blind spots. I can see hers. But then, you know. Then you get mirrored. Larry can see our blind spots. Yes. And we can see, your, you know, and then and then groups can see groups. And so. So we need each other in yeah. that way. In that I way. I love this. I, I love the community piece. You know that. And, mm-hmm. and the piece that what's coming up for me as I'm listening to you is, um, yeah, there's going to be a place where the relationship has its combined blind spot. Yep. Yeah. That's going to happen. And the normative thing is, oh, we can fix that ourselves, right? Or we'll just put up with that. That's just the way things are. Um, that's the way it's supposed to be. Relationships are hard work, 
all these, you know, belief systems that, mm -hmm. that and, and then there's the really big fear that, you know, you, you're gotten past it with each other, but that other fear of appearing like you don't have it together with other people, family, friends, anybody else. So there's another huge breakthrough piece that you kind of have to do as a couple, isn't it? To even like step into community and say, hey, you know, can you help us cross this bridge? Yes. Yeah. You know, we, uh, it's pretty common to, to compare the inside of your relationship or marriage um, to the outside of other people's. Sort of like, how does it feel when we're when the doors closed and we're knee deep in a fight? And how does that compare to what other people's Instagram looks like? You know, and uh, or like the inside of my airplane and the out your the outside of your airplane is all smooth and sleek, and inside of my cockpit is all these buttons, and it's very confusing. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. It's a huge mess. So, um, so you really, uh, it's real valuable to be in, in relationships with other couples where you trust each other enough to show you the inside. And and I'd be remiss not to say, and there are people like Larry and us and many others in the field that have have done many many decades of work to be as the cleanest and clearest mirrors possible mm -hmm. right and so it's often i i just want to give a caveat to what i said because because I, I get to be the recipient of this in, in my couple sessions where where the couple's having a fight and they ask all their single friends uh and all of their single friends say oh you should leave him you know like like they're, they're yeah, almost always it's it's to dissolve and that's part of why they're single yeah. is like dissolve the relationship you know you shouldn't try to work that well, out that sucks the, the number one piece of advice given by single people tends to be um you should stand up for yourself more in the relationship and not don't put up with it yeah, yeah. which sounds like reasonably good advice like we <laughs> yeah on the on the surface yeah so you know when they're saying that they've got an idea of what relationships are like which is not what you guys are expressing or teaching or modeling yeah, right so when they say that it's their truth but they're speaking about a relationship that's not evolutionary right in in any way shape or form and this kind of gets to what the epiphany that you were talking about from a couple of weeks ago because uh if i'm not going to stand up for myself which is by the way my idea of who i am um and, I, and I'm not going to collapse and just stand up for Jennifer and then be kind of a doormat. What, What's left? What is there that we yeah. can stand up for? Um, and um, do you want to talk a little bit about? Uh, we can. It's up yeah. to you. Yeah, let's go for it. Let's start. I want to just say to everybody who's listening, thank you for staying with us and being with us. And, and if you're feeling braver, for sure, put on your video. But there's a chat room. And so if you have questions as we're going through, please feel free to contribute. We want this to be interactive and there, there's no way I'm gonna come up with all the questions that you might have. So please feel free to offer them. All right, Jennifer, go to I'm gonna, I'm gonna type a message to you all while Jennifer's fishing. Oh, great, great. Well, well, this, you know, there's, there's we, we talk about like, there's these three pillars that create ordinary, uh, a, you know, from an ordinary to an extraordinary relationship that are, three things that you really want to get good at if you want to relate to other humans <laughs> and specifically a, a romantic relationship. But um, uh, the, the piece that's, that Brian is referring to is we often have two poles in a relationship. And you mentioned this, right? Where there's, there's me over here and there's you over there. And if you're in a kind of an ordinary relationship, that makes sense and you commit to each other. So there's these two poles, each committed to one another. And when, when that's your kind of system, when you're inside of that kind of relationship, which seems like that's the only thing there is, then when you have any kind of argument or any kind of upset, then it's kind of one, one ego battle against the other ego battle, one preference fighting for the other preference. And there's not really, if we step back, a right or a wrong in that. And so there's really, a, it's hard to get out of that power struggle, right? So what we what we like to add to couples and and people in relationship is that there's actually it's more extraordinary when you have a third pole right and when you identify with a lot of conscious care what that third pole is and here's what i mean by a third pole right if there's you and there's your partner 
the third pole becomes the relationship vision. This is the reason that you're in a relationship. And that, that thing that you both have has shared that you're almost more committed to than each other. And that third pole, it's like a three-legged stool is more stable than a two-legged stool, right? And when you have that added stability, it pulls you, literally pulls you up and out of almost every fight that's about, I want it my way. No, I want it my way. Who gets whose way? Which ends up being a lot of fights, right? Like, well, you should be this way. No, I want to be my, the way I am being. I don't want you to be the way you're being. Like all of those fights can get resolved if we add the third pole, we share in it. It's, it's a relationship vision and, and it sets the direction of the relationship in a conscious way. And most couples that we talk to, that's a, a brand new idea. Like we have visions when we open a, an organization, like there's a mission and a vision and a, you know, values that we create in a relationship. I mean, in a, a corporation uh, or an endeavor that's collaborative, but we don't do it in our relationships, yes. right? And so we've got a big missing hole in our relationships that isn't allowing us to set the direction. And what happens instead is if you have two poles and you don't have that third pole holding you up and evolving you out of your patterns, and devolving into needs and preferences and transaction, then you, you end up dissolving and it, the, the partnership ends up either fighting or dissolving. And so this idea of having a third pole, of having a consciously created relationship vision is one of the most important kind of breakthrough ideas to go from ordinary to extraordinary because you don't want your automatic narratives the, running the show your patterns and your narratives. And that's what's going to run the show if you don't have this. Got it. Got it. So I don't know if you can tell I'm like chomping. You're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, I am a big proponent of that. And I taught and, and even help people understand how to be this third pole from my perspective, right? So I've always seen there's a you, there's a me, and then there's what I would call a we, right? We. Yeah. right? But this is bigger than that. That's not just the us, right? That yeah. You bring in relationship vision. Um, and I think there's all kinds of ways to do that us, right? So that we don't deplete the individuals, um, but actually just add to the, to the potency and the, and the possibility of supporting the individuals without taking from one another. But the, the vision piece is the one that really struck me. Yeah. And um, I get really hit home, and and it took me a number of relationships to figure out the the you, me, and we thing, right? But I, I don't think I clearly got a vision. I had personal visions, right? But I didn't cultivate that combined vision. And, and this is I'm curious, really curious. I mean, you can teach us a little bit how uh, how we do that. And before we go there, I noticed that there's a couple questions here. And one of them was a, was about if I don't have a current partner and I've had enormous failed relationships. <laughs> I think we all have answers to that. You guys want to add something to that real quickly? Because I think it's important um, before we go down the road of, of what could be to um, have a healthy relationship to what was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's actually, uh, and thank you for this question. Um, it, it's actually very connected to what Jennifer was just talking about which yeah. is this third pole or this vision. Because what makes the third pole work in a relationship is that both people are very committed to it. And that commitment in a way comes prior to being in the partnership. So um, when I met Jennifer, the thing that I was most committed to was boundary pushing. I wanted to, I wanted to see the limits of a thing and then expand those limits for myself, for other people. I wanted to push other people's boundaries so they could expand. I want to push my boundaries so I could expand, you know, not cross or break, but not big, big distinction there in case any of you are going mayday, yeah. mayday with, with <laughs> consent. Uh, yes. You know, just like what, where are we limited and how can we be less limited? And so I just started telling every woman that I met, Hey, my relationship with women in general is about pushing boundaries and expanding 
And if that's exciting to you, then we probably should hang out. And most of them said, that's great to hear. And then kind of drifted away. <laughs> I'm so glad to know that about you. And um, I, no, thank you. You know, but then I met one. That sounds scary. I'm out of here. No. Well, I met a few who were like, oh, that's cool. But then they're like, you know, maybe as a side thing, but like the main, I'm like, no, 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 this is really what I'm into. And then I met one who was like, oh yeah, uh, that's, you know, let's What's find them. <laughs> and I was like, wow. And so, so when you arrive at the thing that uh, is most important to you, whether it sounds like it should be like, that's not a very lofty change the world kind of thing, but that's what was true for me at the time. Um, and, but if you're honest about it and it's true and you are driven by it and you just advertise that that's what you're driven by to as many eligible people as possible, then you'll attract the one who is up to the same thing. And then that can start to form the third pole of the relationship. Okay, well, together we can do this more effectively and fantastically than, a, than apart. And this is a little bit different than, oh, we both like to go hiking. Yeah, we yeah. Travel, we both want kids. There was, well, I don't know, the kids thing is, is uh, I'll remove that for a second. But, you know, the, the similar likes that uh, a lot of people put together, and, you know, I have my own three legged chair analogy and that's kind of that who piece you know their similar beliefs and desires mm. it's a little different than that really isn't it it's yeah like i i just want to add exactly what you're saying so to the person that's asking this question um if you're single right now imagine how and, and you want to be in it's just assuming you want to be in a relationship and you're interacting with people how much more compelling is it Instead of like, oh, you like movies? I like movies. You like Nietzsche? I like Nietzsche. Like, <laughs> like, like you know, what do you like? And, and, and as, as an opening salvo to like getting to know each other, right? How much more compelling is it that you bring whatever is moving you, whatever, you, whatever invitation you are to like, here's the what drives me. This is my, my, my vision for how I want to relate. Do you, can I invite you into that vision? Does that sound like fun? Mm -hmm. Like that that you would even arrive at it as you are inviting people in so that people can self-select, run away, like Brian said, if it's not for them and come towards you. Like if your vision is around uh, radical self-expression, like where I, I want to make sure that you're fully liberated in your expression and I'm fully liberated in mine and that we are doing that for everyone. That's my vision. Does that sound like fun? Does that sound compelling to you? Let's talk about it. Now, that's a great first date. Like, oh, well, here's what I love about that. Here's where I'm worried about that. Oh, that sounds exciting. What does that look like? You know, you're, you're, you're creating a higher level conversation and interaction that's having people step up and rise into, into it. And it should be authentic. So don't just say something lofty and beautiful that's not real for you. That's the key. But it's, but it's good. I, like for the person that's single, like I, I think you ought to be meditating what this is. You know, we have a, a really unique process like we don't think just any visioning works. There's a real specific process that we teach. However, you know, so I think it's really good to find people like us that know how to take you through that process. Mm -hmm. But either way, I think it's good. You don't have to be in a relationship to create one. What's, what's yeah. going through my mind, and I think I came up and talked to you too at the end of, the, of your talk, I was going, okay, well, I can just imagine someone going, well, you know, it's three, four, five decades, and I thought I wanted to do this, and I thought I wanted to do that, and now I'm not sure what my vision is. I yeah, mean, I mean, I think one of the greatest fears. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Say, say the last bit again, Larry. Well, it's just that 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 piece of feeling a little lost. It's like someone coming up and go, well, "What's your life's purpose?" You know, and it's like, "Oh God, that's a big question. Do I have to answer that? Do I have to answer it correctly? And can it change?" You know, so, um, you know, how I, I would love to hear a little bit like tease us maybe with sure. defining this vision. Yes. Uh, I want, uh, just for romantic relationships, but for how we show up on a daily basis as well. Yeah, it really does set the direction. Imagine trying to relate given that we don't aren't given any tools uh, you know we'll take reading and writing and arithmetic and history and science and not a single bit of help and on on the area of relating i mean just for one that's just ludicrous 
because you spend almost all your life interacting with other humans. Like there, there ought to, there, there ought to, there ought to be something to help you do that. <laughs> but, um, you know, as you're going through life and, um, imagining that like you could enter a relationship without any sense of direction, what's going to happen is just all of the automatic narratives and patterns and all of the, un the unresolved wounds with your mommy and daddy and everyone that's ever harmed you, that's going to be running the show. And so what we want you all to do instead is like the beginning of this, the, te the teaser, if you will. And we have a whole course where we actually go way deeper and support you through it is that, um, we think of these as um, they often fall into one of three buckets. So even if everyone on this call could just identify which of these buckets you might find yourself in, this might be uh, get you uh, at least the first step out of many steps towards it. And so here are the three buckets that, that relationship visions tend to fall within. The first is I would call like the safety category. Right. And so these are the visions and all of them are as unique as each person. Uh, when you really develop them and they're as unique as each relationship when they start to become shared. But safety is 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 like, I, I go out into the world and it's a hard world and I want to come back to my relationship and I want it to feel like a refuge. I want it to feel foundationally safe and I want to feel like it's I'm we're healing with one another. And so why am I in the relationship? What is my vision for us coming together? Is that we create utter kind of safety, utter healing, a refuge sanctum, and a sanctum, right? And so any of the visions that are in that category are the reason we're in relationship is that like to create that safety and, and that that is foundational and like you can't even do anything else until you start there. So that would be like category one. Sorry. <laughs> what? No. Um, the second one category <laughs> is I would call the, the happiness category, right? This is bliss, ecstasy, joy, pleasure, right? This is in the Eastern religions, the appreciation of the present state, the yesing of what is right? So the, the, these visions that all fall in the happiness category are, I'm in a relationship, my vision for a relationship is that we're in it together in order to find pure joy, pure bliss, and that our relationship is in service to us finding that true fulfillment and bliss in life. And so, that- Sometimes I say like a, a partner to adventure with or a, a companion for the journey. For the, yes, yeah, like yeah that would kind of all be in this category of like happiness, yeah? Um, and then the third category is uh, what I would just call transformation or evolution, transcendence, right? Why am I in relationship? What is my vision for what we would be doing together if we were relating that we could share? Well, I'm in a relationship in order to transcend who I am, to continually be at the cutting edge of my own evolution. And I want us to be continually growing. Yeah, I, I believe I can grow more in a relationship than I can on my own. Yeah. So that's why I'm in one. So, so each of these three, it's important for you to reflect. Now, of course, we all want all three, right? So the, the, the question everybody says when we say this is, well, wait a minute, I want all three. I don't want to choose. And I don't agree that people want all three. I think maybe they might, but there are people who take a stand. I, you know, I've done all the growing. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm done with that, right? Uh, but, but, but there's a, a, a preferential order that is even subtle. It's like in your DNA, almost like, where what's your go-to? And if these are at odds, like if you have to give up a little on one in order to have the other, that in that moment where you'd have to choose between them, you would instinctually choose one. So as an example, um, if growth, for instance, is, is you're in that category of visions, you're willing to give up on happiness because sometimes it's hard and difficult and sometimes you have to go through pain and suffering in order to grow. So that's some of the experience of growth it doesn't have to be, but you'd be willing to feel that pain in service to your growth and give up on the happiness for, for a time. And that and if you make that trade off, then you're in the growth category. You'd also be willing to have it not feel safe because you're often taking risks. And if you're taking risks, um, you often feel like you're facing a lot of fear and, and, and you're willing to feel that fear because of the growth. Now, if you're a happiness person, you might say we are obsessed in the West with that. We, we, we can't just enjoy the present moment and who we are today and just relish the, the joy of, of every single moment. 
I'm not going to obsess over needing to always find, hide it, fade it, fix it, change it like enough. Like, just like you said, I actually think it's more enlightened to find the joy with what is no matter what that is and, and, and amplify that joy. So I'm willing to give up on this incessant thriving or, or, or striving rather in order for to have happiness. Right. And I'm willing not to, to try to spend all my time trying to childproof the world that I can, even in the face of unsafety, find my own joy, right? And so that's an example of, of someone who might choose that over the others. And the safety people would say, you guys trying to do these other two, like you cannot have these other two if you're not feeling safe. You just don't even have the resource. And so we must start with healing the world, healing the trauma and actually get at feeling about our boundaries are safe, our beings are safe, our partners are safe. We've got to start there. And I'm willing to give up on a little happiness to face that healing. And I'm willing to give up on always needing to strive to actually create a little more safety. So this is what I mean. Or, where, or an, another narrative for the safety folks is, yeah. I want to go in my work life, for example, I want to go dive deep into the darkness. I want to go volunteer in Afghanistan. And so I want my relationship to be a complete place of healing and safety so I can recover from that. Um, so that it, it gives it fuels my ability to not be that way in the rest of the world, the rest of my life. So, well. yeah. So, so to answer the question, just, to, and then I'll, I want to pass it back to you, Larry, is like, you said, well, can you give us a teaser? How do you do this? Like, I think it's good for all of you listening and any of you watching the recording to really, not what your PR department wants, but really feel into those moments when you had hard choices and feel into the moment of what value was underneath the choice that you embody that's had you choose whatever you chose. And that when you, when you excavate your values and see, you'll be able to tell, oh, I chose the, this value and that probably belongs here. And that will give you a sense of naturally where you're at around your visioning process. Now we have a much more complex and interesting nuanced way to do this where it doesn't stop there, right? So this is like a, a tease of, of a much bigger process, but this is a really good start. Yeah. Well, for it to really work, it's gotta be. Sure, you know, it's like when yeah. I hear values, um, I immediately go, is that a, it's an ends value I'm sure you want, but lots of people just speak about their means values, like how they're getting to an end and they never get, they never even under, uncover those ends values. Yes, yes. I mean, if, if you take people down that path, to really get a hold of what those are, you know, those, those top most important values, mm -hmm. uh, values. Yeah. Yeah. I think one, one of the biggest fears that people have is growing apart. Mm. And I think the the only sure way to not grow apart over the long haul is to make sure you're growing together and, and either becoming more and more safe or more and more happy or more and more capable of growth just heading in that direction. Anna actually asked a question about how, if you're giving up your identity, if you're having a flexible identity, how do you not just mold around the other person and put your head oh, in your hands and say, oh my God, who, I don't even know who I've become. And so I, there's a question in the chat. Specifically yeah. about oh, I love this question. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think if, yeah. if you're giving up your identity to mold yourself around your partner's insecurities, then you will end your life thinking like, who did I become? But um, if you give up your identity in service to one of the three things Jennifer just said, like, I'm going to release who I think I am to be even more of capable of creating an environment of safety, even more capable of having fun and pleasure and happiness, even more capable of being a partner for uh, growth for me and for my partner. If you're giving yourself up to that, then you'll never be regretful of who you end up being. So the distinction yeah. I get there is that you're not giving yourself up to the other person. It's like, no, oh. I'm going to give up this personality trait so you can have this. You're, you're, which you're, is codependence. Yeah. Yeah. Which is exactly what you don't want, which is what ends up having you 10 years down the road going, who the heck am I? Right. Um, instead, you're looking at these pillars and you're making those the areas that you're um, focusing your desire and drive towards. Right. Well, here's what you're giving up. 
And it's the only thing you're giving up. You're giving up your limits, Mm. the things that limit you, right? So it's not that we're endorsing, oh, flexible identity, meaning that I just have to become what my partner wants me to become. It's all what you're giving up is anything that's limiting you such that on the other side, what you're, you're getting to expand into your range so that you have, you have, you're actually more sovereign, you're more empowered. The container is never that you give up to be less. It's always that you're giving up the limits so that you can be more. And I often will say the world doesn't need you to be less of anything. It needs you to be more of everything, right? When you can actually, with no uh, resistance, move in any direction, that is liberation. When there's no limiter going, I can't do that. I can't be that. I can't, you know, I'm not sexy enough. I'm not smart enough. And you let go of that for a larger container that your partner is holding, which is this vision that's, that by design is much bigger than you. Then it's never, there's never an experience of feeling limited. It's only experience of dying into becoming what I often say. I got to die into becoming the woman I always dreamed of being in my love story with Brian. Like the woman I am today didn't exist when we met. Like this woman that stands before you now, I, I've had many, many iterations and it's, I'm so expanded. So the potential yeah. was always there. but the- Always there, yeah. And, the, and, a, and a partner just helps create through that stable commitment can often create enough of that stability to allow you to really leap forward, right? And that's what we want couples to do. That's what we, I mean, you could do it with your colleagues, your best friends. We want you to consciously craft the visions that you have for why you're even relating. Like even with your best friend, why are we friends? Like what is the purpose of our relationship? What are we actually exploring together as friends? Imagine even that, like that you were conscious about it instead of it just being, you know, talking about the newest Netflix show you saw or you know, what you liked or didn't like about what your partner did, you know, like you, you can actually take everything to the next level. It's courageous. It's life-giving. Yeah. It's exciting. So it never fizzles. You, you never have a boring, passionless life. If you take this on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sweet. It's, yeah, it's the thing that, because you choose it on the basis of what matters most to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, in a pursuit of what's your third pole, what's your relationship vision, or if you're single, what's the vision that I'm going to build a relationship around? You're going to invite people into, right? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to implant a question in your mind, uh, which is, <laughs> how, how do you know the difference between something that is um, designed to make you more of who you really are versus something that's designed to um, make you safe from having to try to be your best? Because both can feel like desires, both can p- feel like preferences. Like, oh, I I prefer it to be this way. I like it to be this way because I'm I'm nervous to talk in public, so I want I don't want to have be required to do that. Versus, you know, that's one way to choose. Or, um, hey, how can I like, like what was the version of me that I would be most proud of, that I would celebrate the most, that would bring me to tears. Wow, I can really be that. And then how do I commit to going in that direction and then find someone who wants to walk the path with me and, you know, become that thing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Can you give us some examples of some of the kind of breakthrough visions that that couples have experienced? Sure. In the process and going through this process? Because you know, that just those examples, I think, will help tee up some ideas. Yeah, so it's not so abstract. Like, what, what, what do these look like? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, um, shall I give a few? Yeah, yeah, either of us. Well, uh, I mentioned the one that we had when we first met. Um, but it didn't take very long be- be- for us outgrow before it. we kind of outgrew that one. Yeah, because we were, were growth people, right? So the more we grow, the smaller the vision feels in comparison to us. And so pretty soon we said, you know, what, what I really want most of all is to truly live an extraordinary life. And I think if we're in partnership together, we can co-create an extraordinary life better than I could alone. So, you know. And, and then, then we, we deepened and, and defined extraordinary to mean to us something very specific, because that could mean anything. 
Yeah, thank you for that. I was just going to go, well, wait a second. Can what we... does that mean? Yeah, because that doesn't mean anything uh, outside of itself. But what it meant to us is that we wanted to be sort of iconic embodiments of transcendence, freedom, devotion, contribution, and community. And so those were our five pillars of values. And we literally got married in front of these five pillars that had banners on them with those five values. That was what it meant to us is the values that we wanted to embody the most such that every interaction with us, we wanted both to bring in the, in the inside of our relationship, these five, but also bring those things to all the people that we interacted with so that our relationship graduated from just being about us, but to actually being a contribution. And so those five values become, became what it meant for us to be extraordinary. How did you go about discovering those values and yeah. realizing that you were very aligned with them? And, and uh, on the backside of that question is, I know oftentimes from my experience that people have, um, they'll think they're different values um, because they go about getting to them in different ways, yes. but they really are the same values. Yes. So, um, That's important right there. Like, how did you get to, how did you discover those values and, and realize that you were aligned and at the same time, allow yourself to really approach them in different ways and know you were still in alignment? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a great question. Do you, you, uh, yeah, you so want me or you want to go? You, you sound like you want to go. What? Oh, yeah. I have some things to add. I mean, one thing is to look at your, your behavior, look at your choices and particularly hard choices. So if you, if you recall the last few really hard choices that you had to make and you try and figure out what values each of the options would have attached to it. So um, should I leave this job where I feel oppressed uh, and I don't feel self-expressed, um, but it's got great money? Should I leave the job or should I stay? And so staying would be uh, maybe a value of responsibility or of uh, wealth or of you know status. Leaving would be a, st a value of self-expression, um, you know, change, change of um, newness, freedom. freedom, freedom, integrity. It could be you know it depends on what it is for you. But uh, and you really like, and then you look at what you did, and you say, wow, when it came down to it, and I felt that those were the choices. This is the one I chose. And if you keep asking yourself those types of questions you'll start to see patterns. Well, but I want to answer more personally because okay. he, I, I like that answer. I, I, thought it was, just, I thought the question was for these guys. You want to answer for us. Well, well, he said, how did you oh, arrive okay. at that? No, no, I liked your answer. I liked your answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but I, in, in like the first one or two months that we were together, we, we had this exquisite conversation and um, this conversation centered around two of the values I told you, which was freedom and devotion. Sometimes we'll say this as sovereignty and unity, right? And we were in that phase of like, okay, let's brick by brick with deliberateness, create a relationship that's really going to be evolutionary. That's really going to work. So we knew evolution was like core to us, but freedom and devotion came because we realized as we were reflecting on what's normal, that what felt like the normal zeitgeist, the normal culture around relationships is I either, I either give up some freedom in order to have this beautiful relationship and I make that trade off because look who I'm getting and look at all the love and I'm willing to kind of limit some of my choices and behave in different ways. And, you know, sometimes it looks like monogamy. Sometimes it looks like a bunch of rule relation agreements in your relationship that you will and won't do in order to please your partner and that you'll limit your expression in order to be a better partner. And that that trade off is a good trade-off. It makes sense because I'm getting all this love. So it's like, I can give up on a little bit of that freedom. I don't really need it. And so we either do that or we say, I want freedom. So I'm willing to give up having that 
devoted partner because I want to play the field and I want to have choices and I want to do what I want to do. And I'm spontaneous guys, spontaneous nights. And I, and I'm, I'm not really wanting to be tied down and in a relationship because I really want my freedom and that that's important. And so we saw that entering into a relationship at all usually involved from the get-go, even if you didn't do it consciously, kind of a, I'm willing to give up one of these two values and their core, meaning if you aren't loved and you don't have devotion in your life, you wither and you die. And if you don't have freedom in your life, you wither and you die. Like you, you, you like wither and, and you collapse if, you don't, if you're like caged, right? Well, in history, freedom is one of the values that is most frequently um, leads to wars. Kill, you know, you'll kill people will kill each you'll, other. You'll kill each other yeah. for your freedom, right? It's important. And you'll you'll kill yourself. Uh, they did animal studies where you could either have the the um, furry monkey. the furry monkey to kind of nurture you, or you can have food. And if when they had to choose, they often chose the nurturing thing over even food, right? So you get that these are instinctually core values. So if you enter into a relationship from the beginning and you're giving up on one of these things, what's going to happen? Well, eventually you're going to be resentful at the choice. Either you're going to feel lonely and that you have all this freedom and you're not really feeling, feeling like you're getting the love or you're in a relationship, you're feeling caged and then you're resentful at your partner. So as we started to explore that undercurrent, that trade-off, we decided, well, what if we engaged in a relationship where we didn't trade that off? What if we engage in a relationship where we wouldn't do anything that that supported our freedom but eroded our devotion, nor would we do anything that supported our devotion but eroded our freedom? And what if that was the playground and that wherever that overlap was, that was how we were going to relate, that everything that both supported freedom and devotion. And even if the overlap started small, we wanted to dis- we decided that we never want to give up on these because that's going to create resentment and that's the end of a relationship. We're going to try to make them overlap more and more and more until there's really nothing that supports our freedom that somehow erodes our devotion, that they're not actually opposites that have to be in opposition. And there's nothing that supports our devotion that would erode our freedom. And that decide that that early one month in, two months in conversation about let's make no trade-offs let's not compromise, was the beginning of deciding that an extraordinary love life, an extraordinary relationship would have both freedom and devotion, both sovereignty and unity at the same time. Was it necessary in the beginning to have clarity about your definitions of freedom and devotion? Mm. Or, Or could you dive in and discover just what freedom really meant to you or devotion really meant to you as you experienced that process of, of getting to that overlap. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the whole fun of it was the discovery yeah. of what those words even meant to us. And I learned more about what freedom meant to me and what devotion meant to me in, the, in that discovery with Jennifer than I had my whole life. I just kind of, I knew I wanted these things, but I hadn't really examined them. I didn't really know what it meant, but we had to examine them because we have these different maps, these wildly different notions of what they even are and what yeah. triggers it and doesn't trigger, like all we, of that. We did this thing that we, we now also do with singles and couples, which is we call it like devotional mapping and freedom mapping, mm. where we go really into the nuance of what actually creates that experience for you because it's super unique. You'd be surprised. It's not just like, oh, say I love you and treat me good. It's it's like <laughs> it's it's like really really nuanced. And so, um, having your partner devotionally map you, and and having your partner freedom like do a freedom map for you, so that they know anything and everything that actually leads to those experiences is, is so uh, it's built so much intimacy. So you do it for each other. That sounds yeah. Yeah, we, we, we do it for each other. We do, we do it in session with other couples. But yes, we helped one another map because most of it was unconscious to us when we met. We, like, we, we were like, uh, I don't know. I, I just want you to be devoted to me. Just treat me good. Like, right. that's how it starts. Like, Freedom. ouch, that hurt. Like, don't do that, you know, but. but <laughs> Freedom means I get to go to the movie I want. 
tonight, except for now, tomorrow, now it doesn't mean that. It means something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you have to dive deeper in together and discover it together. And that diving in process is another really amazing way to have an extraordinary relationship. Anywhere where you have an either or and you map those and find the overlap, um, this, this to us is what creates an extraordinary relationship is that you actually do that mapping. Wow. So I, what I'm hearing, by the way, is, is essential for couples. But yes. I also, what I'm also hearing is anybody that's single, get with your best friend. Get with yes. someone that, I don't know, get with your most challenging friend. Get with someone and do this exercise with them because it's just the beginning of an exploration that probably, you know, and coming to a question that was in the chat room, you know, how do we call in? <laughs> how mm. do we we call in a, a new lover or a new partner well I, i've got to think that this process is going to expedite yes. that just because of the awareness and the clarity and the energy and the purpose that's all fulfilled in this yeah experience. you you just you just said yeah. it so beautifully larry you know, exactly it like it's a it's an awakening exercise Right. And we don't need to wait to be in a relationship to start awakening ourselves and become self-aware of what are the landmines and and the keys to our heart. Like I often will will work with with singles and couples like, hey, let's make it easy to give your partners and the people that know you and love you the keys to your heart. Do you even know what those keys are? Like, can you actually actually excavate them and say, I'm going to hand you the keys. I want to, I want to make it so you can win. Mm -hmm. Like often when I'm talking to the women and it's not that it's so gendered, but like we, often the women will make it really hard for the men to win. And men just want us to be happy. Like you ask a man, what, what do you want for your partner? It's like, I just want her to be happy. It's like, they're so pure. You're so pure in that way. I love men so much. And yet we sometimes make it really complicated like we're so unintelligible about what we want. We test you and we don't tell you got to weed out the men who are trying very hard, I guess. <laughs> right. Right. And, and all of that testing and making it like abstract and like, we just kind of like, don't like say step one, step two, steps three. I promise if you do these three things, my heart's open. We rarely do that. <laughs> or at least some women don't do that. And I, I, I like to encourage that. And I'm thinking in my mind when you're, when you're speaking, you're talking about the keys to my heart. And as a man, I'm going, one key, just give me one key. <laughs> give me one. Yeah. Well, right. we, 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 we may not be able to give you only the one, but, <laughs> but at least if we give you a few. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> the, the big shocker for me, Larry, in this whole process of <laughs> devotional mapping and freedom mapping. Um, first of all, I learned, like you said, you know, so much about myself, which it you know, I wish I had done when I was single so that I could have given, been just been more clear about what's going to work for me. And but the big surprise was the more um, we, the more I felt Jennifer curious mm -hmm. about my freedom and devotion and on board with it. Like she wanted me to feel free and she wants me to feel that she's devoted to me. She wants those things for me. And the more I trusted that impulse, that desire in her, the wider my map got. And now, you know, what are we, 13 years in? Mm -hmm. um, 13 years later, um, when Jennifer, last two years in a row that there was a burning man before before we couldn't, uh, you know, go see each other without masks and vaccines, she went to Burning Man and I stayed home. And I experienced, and so she went and, and had this experience and she had an amazing time. Uh, and I experienced that as devotion to me. I experienced, I experienced it as loving me because she was taking care of the thing that I love the most, which is her. So the, the map of what it was that like, what I need to feel devotion from Jennifer is now so wide that literally ever, I don't have an experience other than that. And same with freedom. Um, I, you know, uh, Jennifer is, uh, beautifully recovering from uh, a knee surgery that she had recently. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, you know, there to help support that recovery and getting the pills. And, and I'm needing pills. a lot of support at the moment. Uh, <laughs> you know, the supplements, I should say, because they're not um, pharmaceutical pills. They're the other kind of and the machine and the, and that um, what some would say like obligation, I experience is freedom. I'm free to love her and take care of her in a way that she normally doesn't need. And so I get to say I love you in ways that are new, 
And I and so mm -hmm. things that would normally like a, a, a much old, previous version of Brian wouldn't have necessarily felt that as freedom. But the only reason I didn't feel it as free is because I was afraid that I might lose my freedom. And when I could feel her committed to it, I stopped being afraid. And when I stopped being afraid, I realized there is nothing that isn't freedom. I'm walking, I'm literally a walking ball of freedom. And I'm, you know, and I've got nothing but existence being devoted to my existence and this incredible woman being devoted to, you know, my heart. So, so that now nothing isn't, and, and that was the shocker. And what better way to love a human being than to be absolutely devoted to their liberation? Like how else would I love this man? than to be devoted to him being the most liberated version of himself. And when you're like, when you're devoted to that and you're like championing your partner's freedom, all they wanna do is drop to their knees and say, oh, I love you, I am for you. Uh, thank you for being that champion. So it's counterintuitive, but the more you're the champion for your partner's freedom, the more devoted they become. And we're afraid that if I give our part, my partner all this freedom, they're going to mistreat me. They're going to cheat on me. They're going to violate me. They're going to do leave me. leave me. Right. And that that impulse is what creates the toxic cycle of anxious and avoidant that we stay stuck in. And that creates a lot of suffering in relationships. And one of the ways out of that is that if you're a devotional type, that you actually champion freedom. And then you watch, you'll get more of the devotion that you've been wanting and vice versa. If you're a freedom type, if you can champion the devotion, then you'll get more of the freedom because they'll feel stable and loved. And they're like, oh yeah, go out, go out with your guy friends, go out and do what you want. I feel your devotion. There's nothing Brian could do that had me wonder at, at, at his devotion. There's absolutely nothing he could do that would ever assail any of that. And that's a really beautiful place to be. And that's the place we want to help singles and couples get to because what's on the other side of not running all, all that fear is just the safety, the bliss and happiness and the growth that we all want. Well, thank you for that last line because you just invited in my next question. Oh, good. Good. First of all, thank you both so much. Mm. For, um, not just, you know, your wisdom, but for your openness and vulnerability in your shares. Um, you know, my favorite term is courageous intimacy, and mm. this is intimate and courageous, and like yeah. more uh, appreciative of that. Thank you. I want to know. Um, actually, I do know, so that's not even a fair. <laughs> I want everyone else to know how we get more of this. Um, I, you know, th those that I can see, I can't see all your hands, but who would like like more? Who would like to really dive in deep? And Ariana, I want to see your notes. I, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Someone Perfect. took some notes. Perfect. We hope to plant some psychoactive seeds so that even just one little sentence that we said will will like germinate and create something. But yeah, so you want to talk about how, yeah. how to what's go through this? Coming up and what's available. Um, yeah, so we, of, I know I'm excited. I, I won't say anything yet. <laughs> well, we, we're excited to have you do we it. have a course uh we have a course coming up um on july 10th and 11th which will be a virtual course on zoom just like this uh and the focus of the course is the uh creating a powerful relationship vision so we're going to walk you step by step through the process of how to do that and uh it's that weekend plus we have a three follow-up uh meetings on the following tuesdays for three weeks to really make sure that you get the vision, that it really works, and that you have a chance to see it in action in your life. Um, and when we were putting together the course for how to do this relationship vision, we realized that it kind of relies on some core relationship skills, these four main relationship skills. And if you don't have those skills in place, it's gonna be really hard to actually make the relationship vision work. So we've included training on each of the four skills as well. Uh, in this course coming up. Um, yeah, we, we sometimes talk about, um, you know, when you did, uh, uh, you spoke about our background, we, we love being in a, on an interactive environment with couples and singles where we get to really help re you rewrite your relational DNA, right? Because there's, there's some real like locked in ways of 
of relating. And, um, you know, since we love being, uh, having a flexible identity, we, we love actually getting into the conversations with you to rewrite that patterning so that those toxic cycles, those petty fights, anything that's creating resistance and limitation in your life, we actually can help you unearth that and rewrite those. And so this course is a combination of, of, of the first of the three pillars that we love to teach, which that first pillar is about how do we set from the get-go the direction of our relationship so that we're not allowing our automatic patterns, narratives, and triggers run us. And so this is a deep dive into actually unhooking from that older programming and installing, if you will, uh, and recoding, if you will, a new relational DNA for you, for any of your relationships, present uh, or future. And so that this course is designed to take you through that path. And we do a lot of live coaching and working with you so that everyone leaves having gotten theirs in, gotten theirs done, and also um, a deep dive into, okay, so now what? We have this thing that we wrote that's our vision. How do we actually have that live and make a difference in our relationship. Cause it's not enough to just put some flowery words. It's way more than that. It's, it's actually having those words live in every, everything that you do in every way that you be in every interaction that you have with you and everyone else. And so this course is like, we wanted to make it accessible. People have, have uh, gotten up one-on-one time with us which is a lot more expensive mm-hmm. and often told us, oh, you need to give more people this. Like we couldn't hear what you said there, Larry. What? You've done this this course, you know, a deep dive in this course over over very intimate, like three day weekends, right? Yes. Up there in person, mm-hmm. and now it's for the first time becoming available. Yes. You know, through Zoom, yeah. uh, which is phenomenal, and it sounds to me like you've figured out ways to keep it interactive, so those of us yes. phobic. Um, don't go, oh, no, not another five minutes on a Zoom call. How do I do yeah. it? So the, you know, highly, the- highly interactive. Mm-hmm. You, you with us, you and some love pods for some mirroring with other couples, bunches of interactions, a bunch of, a bunch of conversations that we're going to have you having with the people around you and, and your partner, um, a bunch of skills development that we're going to be doing. So um, it's okay. not just like a passive thing. If I don't have a partner, yeah. then will, I will be partnered or what is the process there? Um, yeah, this, it, the exercises are definitely design, not designed to be done with your partner, but you can you can partner up and do with them with a partner. Um, they're definitely worth it for you to go through that exploration. Like we were saying earlier, it can clarify who you are and are not looking for. And the more you advertise that, the more likely you'll find that person. Yeah, and we can, if, if there are the right number of singles in the course, We'll, we can try to pair you and, and which might mean if it's an odd number, there might be one threesome. <laughs> so of, of, of three that are all helping each other, which actually might be kind of fun. <laughs> so um, yes, we can, we, um, so we have some, some, some ways to adapt it. And I think it's really valuable at all times of your life. Like imagine if you had done this work before entering a relationship, how much headache <laughs> and heartache you might've saved yourself. I actually like the idea that that is that you're opening this up for singles as well as couples, because I think that you know my experience now, I, I listen differently today than I used to when I was figuring out how I could know everything, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and now there's just like these wonderful ahas that come up. That's why I said Ariana, I would love to see your notes. I bet she has some precious thoughts. Mm. You know, if we had the time to share them would be an aha for any of us, right? Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, and yeah. in couples, the, you know, the individual couples, I can just imagine their light bulbs going off and, and you know, how we, that's part of the education for all of us. We always learned a tremendous amount when we take couples through this process and people through this process as they discover themselves, we, we discover whole new aspects of ourselves. Yeah, and we're going to be doing it with 
everyone. Yeah. And and we're gonna and this is the first time we've ever offered this. It's a very it's a unique opportunity because we've never offered this online. We've never offered this as a course like this. We've only done it in retreats uh, with people or in one on one sessions. So we're trying to make this work a lot more accessible and a lot like super inexpensive so that it's really like any couple can do it. Any single can do it. And if you're a couple, you get two for one. So you both parties can have access and participate of course. And so um, I, I just, what, what matters most to me is that we heal the divide is that we not just because I want you to have a better relationship and better sex and, and be happier, but because I literally think that we cannot live in a world without war until we heal that divide. Mm. And like, it's even beyond it, which even by itself is great. I do want you to have those things, but I also really want everyone to have this because I care so much about us ending this hyper divisiveness that creates all the fighting and all of the not getting one another. Mm-hmm. And um, this out of the three pillars, this is the first. And I, it's, it's, it's critical. It's critical if you want an evolutionary relationship, if you don't want to fall into kind of the ordinary and more dysfunctional and even sometimes toxic uh, way of relating that is become the norm. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. There, yeah. I, and I know, so I'm going to grab it here and see what I have. Um, you looking for the link, Larry? Yeah, he, I think he's got his link. Yeah. Oh. So I'm going to, I'm going to put it in the chat room here yes. and it'll also be coming up. Um, those of you that, that are here, we recorded this. So we're going to be sending out a link to the recording that will be available. Um, so that's how you get to the event. And Brian and Jennifer have been generous enough to even a yeah. hundred dollar discount yes. price for my mailing list for all of you that were so wonderful to show up here. And, and I just want to, I want to get clarity because I think there's even a bigger bonus in a way. And that those of you that are single could like, if I was single and I wanted to bring my best friend, Mm -hmm. so it's kind of, We could do that. (laughs) Yeah, the price of the course is basically for two slots. So yeah, so if you wanted to bring a best friend or just another person that you think would get a lot out of this, um, we would we would happily do that because there'll be a a a point in the form that isn't a required point, but where you put a partner in an email address for the person that you want to gift this experience to. So I'm just curious. I don't see all your hands, but I want to know how many people that are listening, whose hands I can see, have a friend that they would love to share this with. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So and if you have really great couples that you want to be in a love pod with that, you know, because they, they've been through it with you it would give you great mirrors. Um, you know, obviously, that would be wonderful, both for us and for you. That um, if you have other couples that you know that you think, oh, they would love this, um, you can also let them know. <laughs> yeah, and if you and if you share with them the link that that we've just given you, yeah, twice now. <laughs> um, yeah, you shared it direct with us, not to everyone. So I shared it with everyone. Oh, oh, good, good. Oh, thank you. I didn't even realize I had done that. Um, thank you for noticing. It was like, <laughs> share a link. What's All good. Uh, so there it is. Um, yeah, share it. Share it. And, and my other invite, if you guys have questions and you want to email me directly and ask, Hey, I don't know. Um, I will respond to you. Larry, I'm at the four answers. You know how to get a hold of me. Yeah. And, you know, and if you've registered from this, you'll also know how to get a hold of us. And we're, we're happy even to jump on a call with you. If you have questions and that haven't been answered, once you look at the page and get any details, if you want to participate, um, you know, we'd be happy to, to do that as well. So don't hesitate. Yeah. So, you know, we told, um, we said an hour and a half, we're a minute over. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's okay. I just love you guys so much. Oh, I know. I you so know, give this moment just for you to, you know, a, a closing something, if you wish. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm basking in it already, but, you know, just add a little more. Give us. 
<laughs> well, I would start, Larry, just by thanking you again, yes. and and um, for and to everyone that's here, um, thank you so much for showing up. Thank you much for investing yeah. this time in your heart. And you know, maybe you feel like I feel that um, that love is the the bit, the beginning of it all. It's the basis of it all. And when when I know that my heart's good and that loving love is going well, it just allows me to do everything else. Um, so thank you for making that important. You know, sometimes we think these other things are like like we got to handle all these things and do all these adulty things. But if if the heart's not taken care of, then um, I just feel so small and incapable. So thank you for making that investment. Um, it really touches me. Yeah, you know, they, they've studied, you know, what actually leads to fulfillment. And in the top of that list, every time they study what has humans feel fulfilled, the number one thing is a, a loving relationship. And, and close behind that is a great friendships and community. And so I see that this whole area of our lives is often underinvested in. Like we don't spend as much time. We'll, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time on exercise equipment and diet pills and, you know, all sorts of other courses, but we often don't invest as much as we could in our love and relating. And I think it's the most important thing to lead to the highest quality of life that you could ever do for yourself. So even if it's not with us, is that that you showed up here to invest in it, to listen and to come. We're so grateful. We love conversations about love. So just find us if you'd like to continue the conversation. We have a Facebook community where we can just jam on these topics and and know that um, we are in support uh, of you living your ideal love life, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. and helping you rewrite your relational DNA. And I know Larry does great work and we do great work there. And so we are here for you. We care about you and your love lives. So uh, reach out if you, if you want to go deeper. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank oh, you. So fun. <laughs> In your expression. And to everyone that showed up for this call, thank you. Your energy, your interest, your smiles, your attention is so absolutely uh, it, it's just it's priceless so mm -hmm. much. yeah on that note if you haven't had dinner go get it <laughs> <laughs> have a great rest of your night have a great rest of your life and we hope to see you and good night and goodbye <laughs>